All right, so what is the Lydian concept, or the concept as they call it? Uh, well, basically, George Russell in 1953 put out a book called The Lydian Chromatic Concept of Tonal Organization and Improvisation. And uh, since that's a mouthful, I'm just going to call it the LCC. But this book was uh, an inspiration to many players such as Bill Evans, Miles Davis, Coltrane, etc. And it really helped usher in this new era of modal jazz. I first came across this concept when I was in high school, getting ready to go off to college, and uh, I really was asking all my teachers what they knew about it. Nobody really knew anything about it, or uh, they sort of didn't have the right idea about it, and it just sounded so cool. And so as soon as I got to music school, I just went to that music library and checked out a copy and held on to it, really bogarting it as long as I could. To call this book a theory book uh, it might be a little bit misleading. It doesn't really uh, theorize or like explain anything, really. It, it's more of a strategy and sort of a vibe of the time. And I would say that's worth studying more as a cultural artifact that has influenced a ton of musicians and composers and improvisers, more so than something that is going to like be a theory of everything for jazz or something like that. All right, so in this video, I just wanted to give you the quick gist of what this is all about and sort of give you a flavor for the concept. So basically, it's kind of Lydian all the way down, uh, applying a Lydian lens to everything. Now, this doesn't mean that every little piece of music is going to be in the Lydian mode, but it does allow people to reduce uh, what they're doing to the Lydian mode and substitute that in as needed. A good example of this, even though it's actually more uh, about like Dorian substitutions, is the guitarist Pat Martino, who really just kind of sees everything in terms of Dorian. And uh, I, I do something very much like this, but I see everything in some sort of flavor of Lydian, uh, at least when I'm playing jazz music that has a sort of septatonic leaning language. All right, so what's so special about the Lydian mode? Well, basically, if you stack a perfect fifth on a perfect fifth, on a perfect fifth, on a perfect fifth, you know, say C to G to D to A to E to B to F sharp, etc. When you get those first seven notes and you construct them linearly, uh, you, know, you rearrange them to fit in that octave, then you get a Lydian scale. So it's basically an Ionian scale with a sharp four. And so Russell thought that there was a certain level of primacy for the scale uh, where this would be sort of the mother scale, if you will, while most of Western music has assumed that the Ionian scale is the mother scale. Now it's worth noting that sure, the perfect fifth does have this extra resonance and uh, you could you know stack it to get this chromatic scale. Otherwise, if you stack fourths, you could also get this, but this is kind of flipping it. This is an inversion of the perfect fifth and it would give you a Locrian scale if you treated the first note as the root. And the Locrian scale has been argued as not even being a real mode by some people. So when Russell starts talking about things like tonal gravity um, and like harmonic stability, the stability here comes from the perfect fifth being resonant. But it's worth noting that uh, besides the, the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, and the semitone, you can't continually repeat an interval and get the 12 tones. For instance, if you repeat a major third, you will cycle back very quickly to the root note. Um, similarly, if you stack minor thirds, you will a little bit less quickly uh, return to the root note. Uh, so it, to get all 12 tones, you have to do either a perfect fifth, perfect fourth, or a semitone. And the perfect fifth is the brightest, sort of the widest, most vertical of these options. Now there's a lot of discussion of sort of like vertical, horizontal, linear, all this type of stuff. And the example that George Russell likes to go with is uh, the playing of Coleman Hawkins versus Lester Young, where Coleman Hawkins uh, sort of does this vertical outlining of chords and uh, Lester Young was a lot more scalar or you know linear in his playing. And you know there's nothing wrong with either of these methods, but uh, it's important to be able to sort of interpret a tune and go back and forth in terms of how you approach the changes, because that's a huge amount of what jazz is, is being able to follow along with the harmony and actually, you know, play the changes in your linear playing or your, you know, arpeggios or whatever uh, in a convincing way that, you know, if you didn't have anybody accompanying you, you could still hear the harmony, even if it's one note at a time. Now, as I was looking into this after you know many years, not really like actively thinking about it, 
I saw some terminology from like the sort of jazz academic world, like avoid notes and uh, sort of funny things like that, that come out of these more academic, you know, attempts at codifying things. And what I love about the leading concept and the book itself is that this is a very authentic, very earnest uh, attempt at uh, codifying this without sort of like, you know, involving the jazz educational complex or anything like that. So if you think of a tune like So What or Impressions, uh, you know, these are tunes where it's an A, A, B, A form and you know, basically the A section will just be a D minor seven chord or like, you know, D Dorian, however you want to write it out. And then the B section is the same thing, just up a half step. And so, uh, you know, to get some variety instead of just always being in the same tonal center, you start to see just like these parallel shifts. And this is distinct from diatonic shifts where you might have the same general motion, but it uh, will have its own sort of uh, set of colors within the greater, you know, language of colors for that scale. But this, it's kind of saying, I'm going to move this whole thing up here. And so this parallel movement is something that I think, uh, people didn't really know how to deal with in, uh, a solid way. Like, of course you can just move something up and follow it, but there's something about this parallel motion that's so obvious. And so like, you know, for instance, if you have parallel motion up from D Dorian to E flat Dorian, uh, I think the hipper thing would be to somehow move what you're playing down when it moves up and vice versa. And so when you have an approach uh, for what scales to use and which pitches to use for each chord, this allows you to do something that's a little bit more musical and it's not like, oh, he's looking at some sheet music that told him to move up a chord and then he started just like, you know, you could just like literally pull your guitar up and have it be the right notes then. Uh, so it's a little bit more interesting to like hear these new ways to get around parallel harmony. And you know, if you're listening to something like house music or hell, even like black metal, there's a lot of parallel movement in the harmony where it's, it's not diatonic movement. It's, you know, something like D minor seven to F minor seven to D flat minor seven. Like that's like a housey vibe. Same thing would be in black metal, but a little bit more like triadic, you know, like a D minor to B flat minor to, you know, D flat minor, whatever. Um, so there are more nuanced sort of sophisticated ways to play over this, uh, you know, just straight up parallel harmony when you have a better system like this. And so I think that was part of what uh, George Russell was trying to get at. The focus on color with modality also uh, gave a new sort of life to, you know, functionality and harmony. And so nowadays, if you listen to some of this jazz that's out of New York, it's very complicated uh, harmony that's like, it's not just the, like the housey parallel movement, it's parallel movement with these bass inversions that's, it's super sophisticated and like a lot to digest. And so if you don't have some sort of method like the LCC, uh, then you might not really know what to do. And so uh, being armed with this, I think helps figure out ways to musically get around these more complicated structures. So again, while this isn't a super popular concept today, people aren't really like abiding by it per se. Uh, I think that it's still super worth checking out George Russell's records and uh, seeing how he influenced other musicians like Bill Evans and such. Um, this whole new way of treating modes, I think let us progress in improvisational music and uh, yeah, I hope to do more on this topic later and get into some examples and uh, do some more in-depth discussion. Thanks for watching.